morning, everyone. Uh, my name is David Pasco, and I am the grants manager with the Ecosystem Restoration Program. And I am going to be walking you through this training this morning. To start off, um, I am going to be unmuting everybody in the session, so I'm going to encourage you all to keep your phones muted unless you do have a question as we go along. If we have any feedback issues, I will be, mm -hmm, I will be uh, muting people as, as needed. Um, however, hopefully we'll be able to let anybody interject whenever they need to. Uh, I'll be doing that right now, so just bear with me. And you also, if you have questions, you may send them to me in the chat as we go along. And I will check them as we get through each section. So as I said, my name is David Pastor. Uh, I work here in the Department of Environmental Conservation. And I will basically be walking you through the application that we have put out this year for the Ecosystem Restoration Program grant. The first thing to note, of course, is the proposal due date. Proposals are due on Wednesday, June 4th at 4.30. They will be sent to me directly. Uh, my email address is included in the proposal document, in the RFP document. If you have any questions about uh, submitting it, you can contact me with those as well. The next section, we're just going to talk about the, the basic guidelines for the grant program this year. The basic idea of the ERP grant program is to award grants to projects that restore and protect rivers, streams, lakes, ponds, and wetlands from unregulated non-point source runoff and erosion containing nutrient and sediment pollution. We anticipate this to be the only opportunity to apply for the 2015 grants. Uh, the typical projects that we are expecting, the budgets range around $10,000 to $75,000. Uh, we do sometimes award projects that are bigger and smaller than that, so those are not uh, mandatory guidelines, but they are uh, some, some general guidelines as you work on your proposals. Everything is going to be evaluated on a competitive basis, and we are uh, limited in the amount of money that we have available, so uh, all, all funding is contingent on how much money we have to get out, uh, give out to people. So I don't know what that amount is at this time, but hopefully it will be in line with what we've uh, done in previous years. A couple key things about this year's uh, proposal request is that we are strongly favoring projects that are identified in the Department of Environmental Conservation Tactical Basin Plans or other state sanctioned plans, including river corridor plans and stormwater master plans. If you need more information about your tactical basin plans, there is a link here in the RFP to uh, information about the basins. Related to that, we are uh, requiring this year that all applicants contact their watershed coordinators during the preparation of the proposal. Uh, that link will take you to our website where you will be able to locate the relevant watershed coordinator for your pro project proposal. If you are unsure of who that is, you may also contact me and I will be glad to put you in touch with the right person. So we are requiring you that you, you must contact the watershed coordinator during this proposal preparation process. Uh, we are doing that in order to ensure that all the projects are, are targeting a uh, major problem area uh, that we are interested in funding. 
eligibility requirements, uh, Vermont municipalities, regional organizations, nonprofit associations, citizen groups, and state agencies are eligible to receive funding. Please note that individuals, for-profit entities, and federal agencies are not eligible to receive funds uh, directly. However, any of those groups uh, may partner with an eligible project sponsor and work together, and we encourage you to uh, work with other collaborators, including um, these, those not eligible to be a primary applicant. Each organization may submit up to two proposals. Um, however, we do encourage you to uh, form partnerships and collaborations with other organizations and municipalities. And so if your organization submits two proposals, you may also be a collaborator or partner on as many other applications as you would like. And we encourage that. Uh, one thing to note is that we are, um, the two application limit does not apply to easement proposals. And this is due to uh, some history in which we have a small number of organizations in the state that are developed, that are involved in easement development and we would like to encourage as many of these projects as possible. And then once again, I'll reiterate the, the due date for these proposals is June 4th uh, by 4.30 p.m. and they'll be sent directly to me in electronic format. If you have any issues sending it electronically, please contact me and we can talk about that. So that covers the basic guidelines for the application this year. Uh, I'm going to move on to the application itself unless I have any questions. All right. So this year we have change the format a little bit of the way the RFP works. Instead of uh, requesting individual, individually drafted proposals from each applicant, we have created uh, a form that we are asking people to fill out in more of an application type manner rather than uh, a drafting a, a proposal. Uh, many of the proposal pieces that you've done in the past are included here, so the uh, level of effort is probably similar, but the format is going to be standardized, which will hopefully help everyone involved um, in the process. So the way that this form works is that the, the document itself contains global forms. So as you see me hover over certain sections of this uh, application, you'll see uh, a little gray box, and this means that it's a fillable field. I've clicked in it, and that means I can change the text that's in there. So any text that is read uh, is text that is able to be changed, and we're asking for you to put in information. And then any checkboxes can just be clicked on, and they will uh, show that they're selected. So I'm just going to walk through this cover page, talk about each of the individual items, uh, and hopefully clarify any questions as we go along. So project title, um, pretty self-explanatory, the title of your project. Uh, please keep it as descriptive but uh, short as possible. Uh, the project location, again, uh, where the project that you're proposing is going to be taking place. Section three here, we have project category. So we would like you to choose uh, which category best represents your project. Um, number four, I talked about briefly at the beginning, but I would like to reemphasize. So this question is basically a yes or no question asking whether or not you have contacted your watershed coordinator. Uh, the point of this is that you do have to contact the watershed coordinator before you submit the proposal, and this is just reminding you and making you check off the box saying that, yes, you did. If you check off the no box, we will not be uh, looking at the, your proposal. 
The list of uh, watershed coordinators is linked to right in this document as well. Uh, and I'd like to, to note that part of the reason that we're doing this is, uh, is to make sure that projects are well focused and that we are providing support um, at, the, at that level to, to make sure that um, the proposals are, are really targeting some of the areas that, that we're interested in as well. Uh, to note, the uh, watershed coordinators are not part of the review process of the proposals anymore uh, because they're so involved with helping you and the fact that we're requiring them to you to work with them, they are not going to be uh, part of the final review process. That will be conducted by the, the Ecosystem Restoration Program staff. Section 5 is asking for a definition of which category your proposal falls under. We have three categories of uh, projects that we'll be funding this year. Uh, number one is a feasibility scoping or design project. So the key thing to know about these categories is that um, the amount of funds that we anticipate providing for each of them is different. So this, the feasibility scoping and design, we anticipate about 15% of the grant funds will target this category. The second category is implementation, which is the construction in installation application or implementation of the project. And this, uh, we have about 70% of the grant funds will be targeted for this category. And then the final category is easements. And uh, this is a, involves permanent protection where no existing protection or regulation exists. And about 15% of our grant funds we plan to target for this category. So keep that in mind as you develop your proposals as well. Um, some of the other categ the, the categories with only 15% of our funds will, might be a little more competitive. So I do have a question here, and it says, so what if you have a project that does, combines design and implementation? If it includes implementation, uh, I would select that category. You can choose more than one of these categories. Um, you can check multiple boxes. So I, I would, um, if it does include design and implementation, please select both boxes. The next section uh, is applicant information. This is pretty standard information um, just the organization name, your address. Uh, we have two contacts listed here, the program contact and the fiscal contact. If you, uh, if you do not have a fiscal contact or if it's the same, that's fine. We're just uh, trying to get as much information at the beginning of this process as possible. Number seven is basically just a reminder that if you do have additional uh, additional information that you would like to include, especially maps, a lot of our, our projects it would be nice to know the exact location of, please feel free to include those. Um, just send them along with your proposal as a separate attachment. Section 8 is asking what type of organization you are. These are the eligible types of organizations that we've included here. There's also an other, if you uh, categorize yourself as a different type of organization, you may put in whatever you would like there. And then the final, final piece of this initial cover page is the amount of uh, funding that you're requesting for this proposal. So that covers our first section. I don't see any more questions. So I'm going to move on to the next section here uh, of eligibility. So this section 
is covering a little bit more about what projects are, what types of projects we're looking for, and uh, basically your proposal needs to meet all of these criteria. Um, all of these boxes should be checked in your proposal, and we're just putting this in here to make sure that you look at these and think about your projects accordingly. So number one, uh, the first one is the fact that the project reduces nutrient and sediment pollution. Again, this is making sure that the focus of the project aligns with the ERP goals of improving and protecting water quality from runoff and erosion. Uh, the second eligibility requirement is that it's addressing unregulated non-point sources. Uh, so the fact that the project is designed to control runoff that is, one, not required by a regulatory permit, and that includes uh, MS4 stormwater permits, or is, uh, two, protected by regulation, such as a Class II wetland. The third eligibility requirement is that it is considered eligible for capital construction funds. The funds that we are distributing are capital funds. Therefore, they need to be focused on implementation of non-point source pollution reduction projects that are have only a minor emphasis on education, outreach, monitoring, and long-term maintenance. So your projects may include those, uh, education and outreach and monitoring but they need to be a minor component. Uh, if they're a major component, they will not be considered eligible for ERP funds. And then the fourth uh, piece of eligibility requirement is that you will provide a stewardship commitment. So this uh, we'll talk about a little later because uh, there's another piece of the application that requires this uh, explained in more detail. The idea is that you need to assure us that the project will meet its functional life, um, that we're asking you to include a commitment um, or an agreement for the design life of the project uh, th that will ensure that the project will meet its functional life, and that will include who is going to be responsible uh, for carrying out this agreement. We'll talk about that a little bit more. So those are the four eligibility requirements. Your project needs to meet all those. Again, uh, make sure you contact your watershed coordinator. They understand these points and will be able to help you make sure that your project is able to meet them as well. I'm going to move on to the application itself. This is where we get into the sections of the application where we will be scoring everything. Uh, this part of the application shows the scoring, the amount of points that are, are eligible for each section. Uh, I'm just going to be talking about what we're looking for as we, uh, and why we ask these questions in the application. Again, if there's any questions, please feel free to ask them as we go along. So the number one question in the application, this says whether or not the project is consistent with the tactical basin planning. This goes back to what I had said at the very beginning, that our emphasis is on projects that are priorities within the tactical basin plans. So we are giving. Uh, uh, emphasis to projects that are uh, specified as a priority in the tactical basin plan or in another state sanction plan. Uh, this includes um, stormwater master plans, river corridor plans, and, and any other state sanction plan. I, again, I keep saying this over and over, but the, the watershed coordinators will help uh, make sure that you are able to, to answer this question appropriately and uh, and understand how um, how the tactical basin plans work and, and what projects are in there. So uh, I will cover some of these other points that we have listed. These are other types of projects that we do uh, award. However, 
as you can see by the number of points awarded, that we are very focused on the, the, the priority projects and the tactical basement plan. So I'm going to quickly go over these other sections. Um, so a project that's missing from a tactical plan, um, if it's not identified in a tactical basement plan or state sanction plan, those are eligible. However, they won't be, uh, they're not a high priority. Um, lower priority category of projects, so these are mentioned in tactical basement plans or other planning documents, but aren't considered high priority. Uh, improvements to stream crossings, hard stabilization of stream banks and shorelands, land protection, so this is when uh, land conservation that does not involve a river corridor easement. Uh, these are low priority and then uh, projects that are eligible for other types of funding, uh, state or federal sources of funding. The next section is the project description. This is where we would like you to describe your project. Uh, basically, discuss what the water quality issue uh, you are addressing, how you plan to address that issue, and then how those, how that project uh, meets the objectives of the ecosystem restoration program that we talked about at the beginning. I would also uh, emphasize that you should include some information about how uh, how your project relates to the tactical basin plans, especially if it's not specifically listed in the tactical basin plan, you may use the project a description to, to talk about that a little bit more. Uh, section three is the stewardship commitment. So we've talked about this a little bit already. And as I mentioned above, we're just saying yes or no. Above and here is a, a box where we'd like you to describe the stewardship commitment and how you uh, how you plan to implement the commitment and what it's going to be. Um, as I mentioned earlier, what we are looking for is uh, assuring that your project will meet its functional life. And so we want a commitment or a maintenance contract that will ensure that the project will meet its design life and that you have someone in place to ensure that that will happen. Uh, there have been some questions about uh, how to do this for an assessment or design project. And for, um, for those types of projects, you do need to show a stewardship commitment, but the stewardship commitment is more based on how are you going to uh, implement these designs or take advantage of the assessments that you uh, have, that you plan to do with your project. So we need to, need to show how you're going to continue with that work and um, it, ensure that it is successful. The fourth section is the project timeline. So this is a pretty straightforward. Um, we are looking for whether or not the project will be completed in two years or less, or whether the project will take more than two years to complete. Uh, this is basically due to the limitations of the funds that we have. We do sometimes, occasionally, uh, grant projects that are longer than two years. However, if you if you do have a longer term project in mind, again, I would emphasize talking to your watershed coordinator about it um, so we can ensure that uh, it is eligible for, for funding. Section five, collaboration and support. Here, we'd like you to explain how you have identified and secured local support for the project, including um, municipality sign-off, landowner sign-off, whatever is applicable to your project. We are not requiring letters of support along with your proposal. However, we do encourage you to uh, get as much support ahead of time as possible. Um, we 
want to make sure that your project is successful and, and often the, key, the biggest challenge is uh, losing support from uh, member and partners in, in the process. So here we just like to know how much that how much you've done ahead of time and, and ensure that you do have uh, at least the verbal support from those those entities involved in your project. Section 6, the Act 110 Flood Resilience and Clean Water Credit. So this, uh, this section is basically, uh, there is a list of towns that are available on our website along with uh, where you can download this application. We're calling it the Act 110 Town List. It is basically a list of town and municipalities that are eligible uh, for this credit because uh, they have adopted river corridor uh, and floodplain protection bylaws. Uh, if your municipality is listed here, then please include it. Uh, I want to comment on this in that if your project is related to lake, um, I, we do talk about shoreland protection bylaws. This list of towns is for river corridor protection. We don't have a list of towns that um, have adopted bylaws for lake shore protection. Talk to your watershed coordinator. They will um, connect to the relevant lakes management person here at the DEC, and they will let you know whether or not um, that you are eligible for these points and what you should put in here. On to number seven. So number seven is the scope of work and budget. So this year, as uh, we've switched to recently in the past, from my understanding, uh, we are going to be granting performance-based awards. And in the interest of making it as easy as possible um, to transfer information from the proposal to a grant award, we're asking you to scope out your work based on performance measures and deliverables. Uh, there is a link here to some sample performance measures that we have prepared to help guide you uh, a little bit if you don't understand what that means. Again, you may talk with me or with your watershed coordinators if you need help with this concept. The idea is that each performance measure is a distinct uh, a dis distinct deliverable that is associated with a payment. Um, we are also requesting three specific performance measures and deliverables to be included in your proposal. Um, number one is a press release. So we require all grantees to issue a press release uh, upon receiving their award. So that would be a performance measure and deliverable would be uh, providing us with the information about that press release and who has been contacted. Um, number two is a blog article for our state blog. So that would be another uh, performance measure and deliverable. And then the third one that we've talked about already is the stewardship commitment. So you should include a performance measure. Uh, stating your preparation of this stewardship commitment uh, and then uh, a payment that's related to that as well. The next piece of this is the anticipated completion date. Again, this should uh, also be connected to that question of the timeline of whether or not it's going to, going to be completed in under two years or over two years. And then we are asking for an itemized budget as well. So this is where you're going to break out the cost based on uh, personnel, travel equipment, supplies, contracts, construction, and other. Uh, we include different columns for the amount of funds that you're requesting, as well as other funds that you might have um, match that you will be including. And we are encouraging. Uh, organizations to include match. We'll see that in just a minute. 
Um, however, it's not required. And then we have the final section of the scope of work and budget is a budget narrative. And this is where we'd like to you to explain your itemized budget in more detail. Uh, basically, if you have a personnel line item, we'd like to know how you came about that number, including the hourly rates for the people that are included in there and the number of hours that they that you have anticipated, um, how you have devised your travel line, and so on. So that covers the scope of work and budget. As I just mentioned earlier, project match. So this is just a checkoff of what range you are in. Again, uh, match is not required. However, it is encouraged, and you will uh, be scored higher the more match that you're able to include. Um, we are open to many different types of match funding sources, including cash, in-kind, and other resources that, that can help expand the project. And then the final piece of the application is the past performance. So we're asking for you to describe any other projects that your organization has performed within the last five years that are also related to targeting non-point source pollution um, or similar type work, describing whether the project was successful, how well you've been able to meet reporting requirements, and your success. Again, um, if you don't feel like you have a lot of this history, I encourage you to collaborate with some other organizations, and you may use the other organizations' past performance uh, in this section as well, if that seems to uh, promote the success of your project further. And so that covers uh, all of the application that we're requesting this year. So once you have uh, typed in all your answers to these questions and completed it, um, you just need to, to save the document um, and send me the send me the Word document and any other additional materials that you have supporting it uh, before June 4th at 4.30 p.m. So I again will ask, that's all that I am going to be talking about today. Uh, I'd like to know, are there any other questions that I can answer for you right now? Well, I don't hear anybody, and I don't see any other questions coming up. Uh, thank you all for attending today. I hope this session was helpful. Again, I encourage you to contact me. Uh, any other time that you have questions, um, I will be available to try to help you through the process. And again, the watershed coordinators, uh, the list of watershed coordinators is on our website. As I mentioned, please talk to them. They will be able to help you through the process as well and can bring me in uh, as needed. But if I don't have any other questions here, then I will say have a wonderful Friday, and thanks for joining us. All right. Bye, everybody.